everything going good? Yes, um, I think we're live now. Okay. All right, thank you so much for being here. Um, today I'm going to be talking to one of the researchers that um, I have been particularly excited about um, talking to. Uh, it took me a while to get to uh, engage Dr. Somia Ray. Uh, my name is Minhaj Rahman. I'm a visiting professor at Islamia University in Bahawalpur. Um, I am also the CEO of a company which is SIDA, um, an AI-enabled data-driven uh, research and industrial um, development um, company. Today I'm going to be interviewing um, Dr. Somia Ray. Um, he is an associate professor at Institute of Service Science at National Tsinghua University in Taiwan. Um, a stellar record um, in academics. He started his bachelor's um, in science, um, in computer science at University of Wisconsin Medicine, exactly where he did his Master of Science later in industrial engineering, and he holds a doctoral um, degree in operation and information management. Um, he has a range of uh, research papers that um, I can simply talk about and uh, waste this hour alone, so I'm not going to do that. Um, and he also has book chapters, working papers. Um, he has been serving as a board member, editorial board members in different journals like Information and Management Journal, Journal of Applied Structural Equation Modeling, Industrial Management, and Data Systems. Um, he has worked as um, program committee member for different conferences, has um, performed his duties as session chairs, panelists, discussing. He's also a proud owner of um, the uh, seminar R package for structural equation modeling that we're going to be talking about today. Um, he teaches courses in business analytics using computational statistics, um, service oriented architecture, IT service security, and more. He is also a recipient of many awards um, in academic research, most outstanding research award in 2019 by Ministry of Science and Technology. Um, he also holds the new faculty research award in 2012, as well as outstanding reviewer reward uh, from Decision Service Journals. Teaching awards include outstanding teaching award um, by National Singhwa University in 2019 among top 2% of the teachers. Um, he's also received um, accolades for his mentoring services. Um, he was nominated as Outstanding Mentor Award winner in 2016 by College of Technology Management. Um, he also holds numerous uh, PhD scholarships. Um, he's recipient of grants both as primary investigator and co-investigator. Um, he has given many talks, uh, some of the most Recent ones are computational code validity and reproducibility for scientific research. Um, we're going to be talking about some of his papers um, that have gained a lot of uh, traction in the field of information um, systems and other things. Um, he has served in advisory board members in a lot of other capacities at uh, NDHU Center for Asia Policy, um, and he continues to serve as um, a peer reviewer for journals. Uh, different journals, and that include decision sciences and journal decision support system and others. The list goes on and on. Um, professor Somia Ray is the kind of uh, professor that you tell your children about. Um, this is a role model for you. Um, his recent uh, appointment was as a visiting scholar uh, from August 2019 to June 2020, where he spent time at School of Information at University of California, Berkeley. Uh, long list of accomplishments, Dr. Samir Ray. Welcome to my show. Thank you so much, Minaj. Uh, those accomplishments sound much better when they're read out than <laughs> when I wrote them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the very um, down-to-earth response to that. This is what I really like about you, that you know, a lot of accomplishments um, are things that you take for granted. And today we're going to be exploring that. I already feel that you're very underexplored um, in terms of your accomplishments. Um, so let's get started with, um, tell us a little bit about your work and the work at your lab that you're doing at the moment um, with Bill's Predict. Uh, we've been talking about that. Um, I'm really curious for me and for my audience um, to know what you're doing at the moment. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So um, uh, one of the things you mentioned was that my undergraduate began in computer science. So that ties into the story a little bit. Um, my research that I began my PhD and that I continue to this day should be quite familiar to most of your viewers, which is 
It's um, survey-based research. It's a lot about user behavior and how do people use technology. Uh, how I got started in that is quite mundane, but important, which is I just was following my advisor's <laughs> uh, course of research, right? A um, couple of things I want to mention here, though. Uh, one is uh, I do have a computer science background, and I have been coding since I was, I can't remember when, maybe 10 years old, maybe younger than that. Um, and so that's always a, something I've always had in my back pocket, even though I entered this world of um, social sciences and um, surveys and all this stuff, right? Um, so uh, once my research was progressing, I started, uh, uh, my, my computer science roots started kind of poking out a little bit, and I started wondering, uh, what can I do with this, these coding skills that I have and that I had developed for some time? Um, and um, uh, one of the things I did was that um, I started delving in a teaching capacity into transforming my classes into becoming more coding-oriented classes, all right? So I was teaching a business analytics class, and that, like in many management schools, was using SPSS and Excel and stuff like that. And I said, well, you know, we can just code this stuff ourselves. We don't need to use Excel and SPSS and everything. So we just started, uh, so I, I started to do that. I started to teach students, management students, how to code a little bit, how to use R and things like that, okay? Um, so my research was progressing. I'm doing survey work, user behavior stuff. And then these two worlds started colliding and coming together in some virtuous ways, all right? Uh, let me mention at least one or two of them. Uh, one of them, uh, which I'm exploring, and is, um, I cannot say I have outstanding publications on, but it's, it's a future direction that I want to really focus on, is that I realized that instead of just studying IT systems, we can actually write our own IT systems and then study how people use them, right? So we can create our own exp experimental platforms, create our own mock, whatever it is, app stores, e-commerce stores, social networks, and ask people to come in, use it, see how they behave, see how they think, and kind of use these kind of uh, experimental platforms rather than only doing surveys. So that's a very promising direction that I wanna devote a lot of my future into. The other thing was uh, about the methodology itself. We were collecting surveys and analyzing data. Um, and uh, um, and uh, I had been already teaching uh, coding for analytics. And then one day I met a colleague of mine, a brilliant colleague, Galit Shmueli. Many of your viewers would probably know who she is, but um, she's our data science guru in my institute. Um, and she challenged me one day and asked, hey, these PLS models that you guys are drawing on paper, I mean, circles, arrows, they look a little bit like neural nets, right? And uh, I keep hearing these things are predictive. And mind you, she comes from a predictive world. So she said, well, how predictive are these things? <laughs> and um, and uh, me and my students started thinking, and we said, well, geez, we need to be able to do a lot of things to be able to train such models, predict from such models. Nobody's done any of this stuff, but hey, we know how to code, let's do this. <laughs> so we just rolled our sleeves back. We started writing our own code to, to implement the PLS algorithm itself. Um, and, um, uh, and so the whole estimation engine, for example, of smart PLS, uh, many of those parts, we started just coding ourselves from scratch. And um, uh, then we started creating predictive tools on top of that and things like that. So. Um, Another stream of research that has emerged then is this methodological research where we are investigating um, how do these uh, statistical methods hold up as predictive tools, all right? And in the process, we had to recreate much of the engines of estimating PLS models and then tools to predict PLS models and more. So, uh, so my research is kind of bifurcated in a sense in that I still do a lot of survey research I'm, now I'm doing uh, uh, more computational research, particularly with PLS, who knows what else in the future. And then I hope a future strand will be to actually uh, start creating our own IT systems and platforms to, um, uh, to, to, on which to collect data, right? So I think this is a broad overview of the research directions that are happening under my lab right now. Okay, very interesting. Um, and I probably, sh it's a good time to build upon um, what you have done um, through the years in your lab. Um, so let's bring uh, one of your uh, most popular papers um, and 
the paper that got you a lot of traction, your 2016 paper, Elephant in a Room, um, and it has emerged as a very strong proponent of bringing predictive power to PLS um, and has gained a lot of um, attraction in terms of uh, there's, there's a lot of discussion that's been garnered by this paper. Um, can you elucidate in a little bit on um, what do you, we know about the shortcomings and capabilities of PLS Predict at the moment, keeping in mind uh, the machine, in, uh, machine learning background which is, in my opinion, leaps and bounds ahead of um, what we know in academics at the moment. Um, we're going to be talking more about its application in social science, but for now, um, okay. what do we know about that? Right. So when we began with this uh, paper, uh, The Elephant in the Room, um, and uh, for those of you who have read it or who haven't read it, or those of you who have read it, but there's a lot of stuff to absorb in there, um, The Elephant... <laughs> That we're talking about here is um, uh, does PLS actually predict, right? Because a lot has been said about uh, PLS is a predictive tool. So um, we took that on faith and we started investigating it. And and then we asked, uh, everyone's talking about this elephant, but no one has seen it. <laughs> and uh, what does this thing actually do? And is it actually predicting? So we entered very naively into this world, and um, that paper in particular was just our first attempt to say, well, it's a regression type model, this whole PLS world. Regression can predict to some degree. Shouldn't PLS be able to predict? Um, we had especially hopes for PLS because if you study the algorithm of PLS itself, it does this very interesting thing uh, where it is not a one-shot estimation of your whole model. It's an iterative process where it partly starts building up the measurement model, uses that to kind of estimate some of the structural parameters, gets those results and goes back to the measurement model, from the measurement model back to the structural, so it goes back and forth between the measurement and structural models and tries to estimate both, you know, one after the other, getting information from one to feed into the other and back and forth, okay? So on the face of it, um, it seemed to us that information is going back and forth throughout this model in very interesting ways. Um, not quite as explicitly, shall we say, as back, back propagation in like neural nets, but in spirit, it seemed to be something like that. So we thought, well, how predictive is this creature, right? Um, turns out, not so much. <laughs> uh, turns out it's actually not so much a predictive tool uh, in the sense of the modern use of the word prediction, right? Uh, instead, what it is, is it's very much a regression-based tool. It is a little bit more, has a little bit more predictive power than, let's say, just taking all your items and trying to predict an outcome item using multiple regression, but not wholly so much so, all right? Um, so it is predictive in the same sense that a multiple regression model is predictive, all right? And, um, but this is not a discount things because multiple regression is still used as a, as a prediction tool in, in, in many places and scenarios, all right? Um, so, uh, so that's kind of what we were discovering with that paper. And then we discovered many other kind of issues with that paper when we were doing that paper. Uh, we realized, um, and, and that paper was really kind of like how uh, the first author of that paper, Galit Shmurli, my colleague that I would discuss, and I started having this conversation about prediction and uh, inferential tools like PLS. And we used that paper to find a common ground and develop some common language between people who do things like PLS or regression and uh, people who come from the predictive worlds. All right, so that paper was, I would say, kind of building up the predictive aspects, but more so building up a common, common vocabulary for these two groups of people to talk to each other, all right? Um, so that was kind of the, the nature uh, of the thing. Um, let's talk about yeah, some um, of the... Yeah. Let me bring in a, a little bit of criticism that you can take with that also. Um, for right. anyone else out there, um, to make it relevant for people who are um, not as um, statistically equipped um, and have no idea what these geeks are talking about. Um, so let's, we, let's have a simple example. So if... Um, in a household, you measure um, everyone's ice cream eating habits for one year. Uh, what we're talking about here is that can we use that data to predict um, the second year of eating habits? Well, this is the most simple way in which I can make it relevant for everyone else. So what it means is that uh, 
the information that we have at hand, um, is it going to be useful uh, to make accurate predictions that are going to turn out to be facts? Um, so having said that, uh, PLS has uh, gotten uh, a lot of criticism. Um, so if I were to read a very well-cited paper, um, it's a very credible paper by Antonakis um, et al, 2010. And remember, this is already 2010. Um, your paper came out in 2016, and then you know, Marco's other papers are there also. Um, so that's how it goes. The problem with PLS, however, is that it cannot test systems of equations causally, or identifying restrictions cannot be tested, nor can it directly estimate standard errors of estimates. Because the model's fit cannot be tested, the modeler cannot know if model estimates are biased. Also, its apparent advantage is over regression-based OLS and 2 SLS or covariance-based modeling, SEM, is rather exaggerated. And that's coming by Hire himself in 2006. Um, you know, that's a paper in the reference. And um, I have seen very few pa papers that actually condemn uh, an established practice in words like this. It goes, we really find it odd that those using PLS would knowingly not want to test their model when they could use more robust tests. Uh, so essentially what they're saying is that there is no advantage for using PLS uh, over OLS or other um, methods. What do you have to say about that? Okay, that's a really good question, and it's different from the prediction question, right? So we, let's first talk about then PLS as a uh, inferential tool. And when I say inferential, just to be clear again for your audience, I'm talking about you are looking at a sample of, let's say, people, or it could be firms, right? And you are making a statement not about that sample, but about the population of people or firms or economies or whatever it is, right? So this is what we call um, statistical inference. You're looking at a, at a small sample, but you're trying to make a statement about a much larger population, all right? So uh, ordinary regression, uh, uh, covariance-based SEM, PLS, these are all inferential tools. That's what they're trying to essentially do is make comments about a larger population, okay? And um, uh, multiple regression and covariance-based SEM, they are uh, parametric tools. So we are able to directly estimate what is the value of certain parameters in the model, like the you know, regression paths or structural paths in the, in the model and things like that, okay? Um, uh, and uh, PLS cannot. PLS is a non-parametric tool wherein it kind of like jumps back and forth solving little bits of the problem, taking that information to other bits of the problem and trying to come up with a solution, all right? So uh, once we arrive at those estimates, we don't really have proper statistical understanding of what those parameters are. So we cannot tell you like, you know, here's a path, here's the value, we can say that, but we cannot say here's the confidence interval around it. Um, so because we cannot do that directly, we do it indirectly, we do bootstrapping, right? So, um, and again, just to kind of um, give your audience a little bit better understanding of what bootstrapping does, Bootstrapping just takes the sample of data you have, jiggles it around, and sees how it behaves. Like, what could other samples look like? It basically is kind of like a simulation technique. It's simulating what could the larger population look like. And then, um, un and by kind of rerunning the model under all that jiggling, it kind of gets, it kind of understands, hey, my parameters are moving around this much. And then that is the inferential part of it. It's, it kind of says, these are my confidence intervals, okay? So it's a very roundabout way of getting to the same kind of answers as CB7 and others are getting at. Um, so so I haven't gotten here. to the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want you to bring um, this point you know, that you wrote in the paper about out of sample, um, yeah. those uh, holdout sample um, issues also when you right. talk about these things. So readers have a better okay. idea of how you're solving this problem. Right. Um, let me get to that in a little moment and remind me again in a second if I don't answer that question. But let me sure. kind of directly first address what Antonakis and others are saying. And by the way, they're very astute people. They're, uh, they're very knowledgeable about all these techniques. So their criticisms are valid and should definitely be taken very seriously. Okay. So what they're saying is that we cannot really get a strong idea of how well these models really fit uh, the data, okay? And, and that's kind of true. We, we don't have like fit statistics around PLS, though nowadays there's some new recent techniques that uses simulation and other methods to kind of come up with those things. Um, and I think there's a couple of things to, to talk about here. 
One is, um, how well does covariance-based modeling actually measure fit and how is that information used by people? Because we have to understand fit before we talk about prediction and out of sample stuff, all right? Um, everyone assumes they know what fit is, but what is, is covariance-based SEM really doing about fit? And um, what it's really doing is, ultimately, it's looking at the correlations of the variables in the data and comparing it to what the model thinks the correlations of the variables in the data should be. And how close those two things are, the actual relationships in the data versus the model relationships in the data, that's what's being called fit by covariance-based people, okay? And I wanna talk about a couple of problems with this. Um, well, one major problem, which is that there's only one true statistical test of fit for CBSEM, and that's the chi-square statistic. Um, but ultimately, people who use covariance with SEM realize that none of their models actually fit if you use that statistic. So instead, what they do is they kind of play around with that statistic, create some other metrics with it, and say those metrics make our models look like they're good enough. So first of all, um, just to kind of address this old school thought about is PLS really doing anything better than CBSEM, um, the argument that many people would make is that even old-fashioned CBSEM that people use um, the models don't really fit, first of all. So um, it's not fair to say, hey, PLS people can't estimate fit, when at the same time, CBSM people have a very fudged around notion of what fit is, okay? So that's to address what Antonakis and everything everybody was saying in 2000, what was it, 6, 2010, uh, 2010. They were not even talking about prediction, by the way, all right? They were not even talking about prediction, they were just talking about old-fashioned fit. So um, outside the world of CBSEM, if you go back to econ econometricians, ec economists, they would look at SEM models and say, what the hell are these things? <laughs> they, even, even those things don't fit. So to the larger community of researchers, this little squabble between CBSEM and PLS is kind of meaningless. It's like, uh, um, it, it's, it's like two school kids arguing about who's more mature. It's like you're both immature, <laughs> right? So, so there isn't really a whole lot to counter there except to say, both these methods are really um, very, uh, very much approximations of the worlds. All right. Um, let's talk yeah. a little bit of, uh, about out of sample issues then uh, and bring prediction back into this. All right. Um, so the problem with both these techniques, covariance based SEM and PLS, is the following. If you show these models to people who do like, who are very astute with, let's say, just pure regression. They'll be shocked because these models are extremely large. They have tons of parameters in them, right? Like when you have a CBSEM or an, any kind of SEM model, it's got like uh, for every construct, there's four or five parameters to measure. Then there's all these, you know, inter uh, construct uh, paths to measure. Like there's tons and tons of parameters. And yet our data size is quite small. It's just um, our data size is just, you know, 400, 500 in usual cases. What what people who are kind of really knowledgeable or you know expert about these kind of tools will tell you clearly is we don't really have that much data for how much information we're trying to extract from it right um and in the predictive world they have a word for this which is overfit what they will say is that you are creating models that are telling me you know 50 pieces of information from just a few hundred pieces of data. That's kind of unbelievable, <laughs> all right? Um, you cannot possibly be squeezing out this much information from data, right? Now, of course, people who use neural nets and other things, they have thousands and thousands of parameters, but they also have tens of thousands or millions of rows of data, <laughs> right? So they, they use much bigger data to extract this much information. So one of the things that we are discovering and simulating and, you know, visualizing nowadays in my lab is that all these models are overfit. They have, uh, we have kind of tortured these models with small data and we're saying way too much about the little data that we have. It's probably not justified. What does that mean? What does that imply? It implies that we have said so much about our data that if we were to replace our data with another set of data, the results probably would not hold, all right? 
And this problem that our model and our model estimates are purely telling us about our sample and not about other samples that might exist, this is both called overfit, but it's also in a more philosophical sense, so we say that these models lack out of sample generalizability. All right, so let me just try to give an example here. So let's say we create a model that is talking about um, how do firms have good performance? And then it tries to kind of explain that using, let's say firm leadership, R&D budget, and a bunch of other things, right? And then we kind of estimate these on some several hundred firms. What we are arguing is that to a great degree, the models, this whole world of SEM, even if it kind of looks as if it's fitting to our data, if we were to kind of reconduct this whole exercise in a completely different context with brand new data, the results would vary quite a bit more than we would expect, all right? And this is kind of a lack of out of sample generalizability is the problem. So our arguments are quite different from Antonakis and others, and we're not really responding to them. That's another issue. I will let your future potential guests, uh, people like Marco and Christian Ringel and others kind of uh, address that. But what our point in our lab and in, our, in my department, what we're working on is to say the models we're creating, you can't use them in the future with new data that you're getting, all right? or we wouldn't advise it. <laughs> You're doing a bang up job describing the data that you have today, but you're not really being able to say much about the data you will get tomorrow. So another way of, being, of saying this is, you cannot reliably predict what's going to happen with these models, all right? Mm -hmm. And why, Very again, because these models are overfit. Mm -hmm. Very interesting that you brought this up, actually. I was, um, before we actually move on to, um, what you're doing about it. Um, let's talk about some of the uh, methodological issues um, that surround uh, what you've just explained about prediction. Um, so if you look at all the papers that have recently sprung up um, using PLS algorithm, um, what we noticed that the most of them are published in information systems domain or uh, marketing domain, marketing um, or, domain. Uh, advertising research and things like this. So we have a wonderful mm -hmm. paper by Jorg Hensler. Um, uh, yeah. I really like reading that. Uh, the fact is that, you know, how does it actually translate to social sciences at all? Um, I mean, I do understand uh, mm -hmm. from the perspective um, of social sciences in general that uh, market research itself, um, all of them originates from psychological methods. So if you read a little bit of history of how these um, tools were generated, Likert scale or forced choice model and things like this, you know, they're trying to grasp um, a concept which is a latent, latent construct that does not actually exist. So what they're trying to do is um, they're trying to use manifest items to create a um, approximation of latent construct um, that is uh, more of an abstract thing. Now, building upon that, uh, it's almost impossible to quantify the latent constructs to its maximum um, reality. So this is why we have measurement errors. Um, now, I don't see how that actually translates that um, to social sciences domain because it, its reach has very limited uh, scope at the moment. It's only information systems um, and marking research. And on top of that, it's uh, it's been attacked from left, right, center uh, for method methodological issues. And then the huge problem comes in uh, the interpretability of that model. Um, who says what model fits? Um, and what is an appropriate cutoff uh, in the output? Uh, so for example, what is an appropriate um, value for RMCA or CFI or NFI or R square. And that of course very varies with the subject that you're researching in. But these are real issues. Uh, how do you think that if PLS actually ever got to the point where it will be an acceptable uh, method uh, would address this lack of um, cameo appearances in other social sciences? Right, fantastic. Really good set of questions and you've really summarized a lot of the critique around um, Structural equation modeling as a whole, quite frankly. Um, and I wanna say that because outside of this world of CBSEM and PLS, people don't really distinguish between CBSEM and PLS. To them, it's all just some kind of structural equation modeling, pokey pokey stuff, okay? So, um, so let me just address kind of three things that you mentioned. This idea of latent constructs. Um, then I'll talk about models and do they actually fit and what does that mean, right? 
And then I'll talk about thresholds and cutoffs and things like that. Okay, so that's the three ways I'm going to answer um, your the, the the kind of the criticisms that people are putting. Let's first talk about latent constructs. Why do we even have latent constructs, right? Um, anyone who's doing a PhD or who's a researcher who's beginning in this field, you start getting into latent constructs. It seems very exciting. But then at the same time with your other eye, you're watching people doing like machine learning and like very hard data stuff and using actual numbers and sales and things. And you start feeling really insecure about uh, who cares about latent constructs, right? Uh, when people are out there with self-driving cars and things like that that are actual, not latent, you know? Uh, well, let me tell you who cares about latent constructs. Um, typically in the world of management, managers care about latent constructs, okay? If you sit down with CEOs of major companies um, or general managers or senior managers, and I get a chance to do a lot of that, um, and you start having a conversation with them and you ask them, what keeps you up at night, right? Um, the naive view for anybody who's not really interacted with higher level of management is you will think that they will say, geez, you know, I'm really worried about future sales of product X, all right? Or you might think that they will say that um, I am uh, really concerned about the click-through rate of my advertisements, right? I mean, that's the way we, we, we think managers, uh, not we, not you and I, but let's say uh, a student still in school would think that managers think, and they don't. Managers never talk to me about actual product numbers or profit margins. They never talk to me about click-through rates and this stuff. This is like very low-end stuff that these are like means of getting to a higher end, all right? The stuff that managers cannot sleep, that makes them lose sleep and which they cannot talk to anybody else about except for maybe many professors is what we call latent constructs, <laughs> all right? So when, we, when you listen to the vocabulary of high-level decision makers, they will not say things like, hey, uh, I need to increase the click-through rate of this ad they will say, why are my customers not more engaged with this product that I've made, right? And if you ask them what does engaged mean, they will say, I, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't actually have a number for that, but you know what I mean? It's like, I, I'm, I'm up all day. I, I, this is my baby. I love it. This is my company. Why are people not crazy about my company the way I'm crazy about it, right? Engagement, for example, all right? Um, or they may say like, you know, um, Customers buy a lot of my product, but as soon as my competitor lowers their prices, all my customers go over there. Why are they not more loyal to what I'm doing? Why don't they kind of give me a little bit of breathing space here? So they'll talk about loyalty. They'll talk about satisfaction. They'll talk about engagement. We are not using latent constructs as some kind of like fashion statement. We're using these constructs because this is actually the vocabulary of high level decision makers. All right. And this is also the vocabulary of ordinary human beings, right? Um, if you're gonna talk about um, uh, the, the quality of a marriage, for example, are you gonna look at like real numbers? Are you gonna look at like how many hours does a couple spend together and that's your metric and that's the only thing? No, you're gonna like talk about like, you know, how is a marriage doing? How's a relationship doing? What's the quality of this relationship? And that quality, again, is a very latent thing, you know, so even the experts, talking about in these domains don't have fixed ideas of what these things are. So that's why we do latent models. That's why we do latent constructs, okay? So, um, uh, so, so I wanna push back a little bit to this, to this whole um, emerging world, it seems, of people saying, hey, nowadays everything is like hard numbers and we have big data and this and that. And I will argue actually, but um, you, you, you don't think like that. <laughs> Human beings don't actually think like that. We think in terms of latent constructs, in terms, in terms of latent concepts, all right? Uh, we are abstraction creatures. We are the creatures of abstraction. We're not creatures of computation, all right? So that's why latent constructs are important and they're not going anywhere. If anything, having sat in institutes and places where a lot of you know, machine learning and big data stuff is happening, you'll be surprised how often someone opens up the door and goes, hey, you guys, you know what? There's this whole world out there where they actually examine latent constructs, where they have latent concepts and they can, they can create relationships between them. These are people who are doing deep learning and this stuff to them. Some of this stuff we're doing with SEM is like black magic to them. They're like, wow, that's the cool stuff, 
Whereas we are looking at them and going, wow, that's the cool stuff, <laughs> right? So um, first of all, uh, I would push back and say this, this world of latent modeling is not going anywhere. If anything, it's going to get a lot more powerful in the future right? and a lot more important in the future because these latent concepts is what is important to human beings, all right? Um, and, and as far as the high-level manager is concerned, if they can get people to engaged, they don't need a click-through rate on an advertisement. They can use any tool they want. They can change it you know, on a whim. But what they want is these latent things. So that's the first thing of your three points you mentioned that I wanted to address about why we still use PLS and SCM and things like that. And they're not going to go away. They're actually going to creep their way into other methodologies, including big data and machine learning methodologies. All right. Um, so that's latent constructs. Uh, did you have a question? Otherwise, I'm going to talk about models and model fit and why that's important or not important. Yeah, um, I think uh, I have a lot of issues to explore um, with you. So I would just rather use your time for the other ones. Uh, so okay, sure. if we could briefly talk about the, I mean, I do understand. I mean, some of the points that you have mentioned, um, I totally agree with them. And all of these con latent constructs, uh, if you really, really look deep into that, um, some of the papers that I read, um, they're mind blowing how you can actually quantify the um, concept that we today think are latent concepts. For example, in psychology, we have a concept like introvert and extrovert, and it seems like it's it's just labeling. Uh, in fact, it's not. Um, what you can do is you can use the skin conductance test to find out you know, how people respond to a certain stimuli or perceived danger. Right. Um, then we have uh, vital signs uh, in medicine, uh, which calculates your pulse rate um, and your heartbeat and things like this. So there's so many things that you can actually use to quantify things. And there are actually labs um, in different US universities um, that do experimental psychology with yeah. that. Um, so you're right. I mean, even though we are approaching it from a social science perspective, it's not as unbelievable that uh, we thought it was you know, a couple of years ago, man. So you're totally right, right in that. So I want to talk now about um, the sad situation uh, in academics that you, you are one of the ones um, who are actually taking the lead um, in this domain and changing the mold of uh, academic research, which I believe is quite lackluster in comparison to the machine learning algorithms and deep learning um, tools, things like this. Uh, one of the methodological problems um, that is justified, um, and that's a very good excuse, which is that the, the sample size that we generally have in our researches in social sciences is, is very small. Yeah. Um, if you know about neural net um, algorithms and machine learning algorithms and feature engineering, they require hundreds and hundreds of thousands of terabytes of data um, to actually fine tune a model. We don't have that mm -hmm. in academics. Um, now that poses a lot of uh, questions about and the validity of that data. And you mentioned briefly about that um, in your earlier response that it's not replicable and, and the predictions are not 100% correct. Um, and that's what actually matters. So this uh, package that you just made, uh, if you could briefly talk about a seminar uh, package that you, I, I believe you've been working with Nicholas Tanks and uh, was Shumeli also involved in that project? If you could talk about that. Yeah, certainly. Well, you've asked actually two questions. Well, you didn't ask a question first, but the first one was a comment that you made about the dismal state of affairs <laughs> between uh, machine learning that you're seeing and these self-driving cars on the road. And then uh, this kind of like uh, survey based or other kind of methodology you're seeing in academia, right? Um, let me just say a little bit about that before I talk about seminar, if I might, okay? Um, which is to say that um, there is a strong divide between these two worlds. And it's not because of the lack of ability or understanding or skills in academia, as one might think, all right? Um, some of the problems is that a lot of these machine learning and deep learning tools, and I've definitely used these, um, is that they are not yet capable of generating new knowledge or of giving us new insights into problems and the ways that human beings need to have those insights, all right? So even though a deep learning model can predict things with incredible accuracy, it cannot give you an idea of why those predictions are happening or what is the important things at play, all right? Um, but you can mix it up with traditional methods like experimentation and other things to kind of derive that knowledge slowly. So I will say that even though we sit on the academic, many of us sit on the academic side, look out the window and say, oh my God, these people in the industry are doing amazing things. They've got like robots and 
you know, <laughs> things that can talk and drive and all this stuff. At the same time, people on sitting on that end of the, on the other side of the window, <laughs> are looking back in and they're saying, wow, these people actually know why things are happening. We don't know why things are happening. We're just toggling switches and if it works, it works and we market it, all right? So there's a lot of envy on both sides, all right? So, so I wouldn't say that it's just a one-way stream of we're luckluster and they're amazing. Um, because they sit there and they ask the questions about us uh, also, all right? Um, and I can say more about that maybe in a, in a, in a separate segments. Um, you asked me about seminar and this tool that we're making. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, um, actually, let me give you a little bit of background uh, for my audience of what this tool is. Um, so, I believe that's written in our language, um, which is, uh, for people who don't know, a statistical language for um, that analysis. I have uh, organized uh, workshops on that myself, and my students know that if uh, some, of, some of them are uh, watching. Um, what I wanted to actually ask you, and that, that's kind of a two-part question. Uh, one is that you, you're going to be, of course, explaining about um, what's the difference between um, a package software like Smart PLS3 and um, R, and what are the, some of the pros and cons of each of them. Um, and then the other part is that um, the software package software like smart PLS3 have the cr built in criticism um, in itself that it does not actually give researcher the room um, to play with the information and tweak the algorithms itself so because it's point and click software. And that might be the reason for its um, relative popularity among um, academics that you know you can simply uh, push some buttons and then you have a model and then you can explain it and you, know, you can tweak with whatever option it gives you. Um, and I think Marco briefly uh, talked about that um, also. Where you're actually coming from um, is a very, I think it's uh, the event card of the research where you're trying to pull in um, all this prediction and machine learning algorithms into um, the academic world, like you have mentioned briefly, that that's going to be the future also. So if you can address both of these questions, the benefits of uh, using package software and what does your R package actually mean in this context? All right, sure, thank you. Yeah, uh, seminar, this R package, for those of you who are familiar with it, um, it, it estimates PLS models, right? Um, and we made it as a, a byproduct of trying to generate predictions from PLS. It was not the original thing we wanted to make, right? We, we needed to kind of make PLS models predict things. But in any prediction scheme, you have to first train your, um, you, have to, you have to go through a training procedure where uh, the computer learns from data and if you're going to use PLS as your prediction engine, then you have to use PLS as your training engine. So we created Seminar as kind of the training engine for being able to do predictions. And training is nothing more than estimation. What you and I call est estimation is just training, is what predictive people would call training, which is you take data and you estimate the parameters of a model, that's training, all right? So that's why we made Seminar in the first place. It was just kind of like an in-house tool so that then we could make the tool we really wanted to make, which was a prediction tool, <laughs> all right? Um, however, in doing so, a few th thoughts came to us, a few things came and several things uh, evolved. Um, first of all, what we'll, in trying to make this tool called Seminar, um, we discovered several things. First of all, uh, that we as uh, practitioners of PLS or SEM methodologies, we don't really understand how this technique works. Right? Like if I ask the average PLS practitioner, tell me how PLS works, like what does it actually do? I would not get an answer. So people would say, well, it's this magic box that I put my data in and results come out and I get published. All right. Um, and I felt that's a shame because we don't know then if we're using it or misusing it or why we're using it. Um, actually unpacking your methodology and understanding exactly what it does will give you a tremendous amount of information about your domain problem. This is not just about getting smarter at methodology and getting more complex at the statistics. If you're interested in solving real world problems, it really helps to know why your tool does what it does. Um, because then, right? Yeah, so, so, so that's one of the things we discovered is practitioners don't know what it's doing, so they don't really know what they're getting and they're, they're unable to tell even a compelling story with what they're getting because they don't know how it happened, all right? Um, so that was one thing we, dis we discovered. So we said, you know, this is good. People should really, uh, we as 
in, in our team, we should start developing this tool so we get a better understanding. We, did, we weren't even concerned about other people, right? So we started creating seminars so we understand how it works, uh, how PLS works. And in the process, we found a couple of other tools out there that did PLS estimation for R or Python or whatever. And we found that uh, they are really outdated. <laughs> Um, a and B, they uh, they require people to think in terms of matrices and this and that, which doesn't fit with the vocabulary that we as practitioners have of constructs and reflective versus formative and other things. So we said uh, uh, our our real pride and joy of seminar is actually not just the estimation engine, but it's the language that we have created around that estimation engine. Like when you create a model, you use the words like measurement, multi-item, single item paths from here to there, right? So you start using the vocabulary of practitioners. So in that sense, seminar is not just an estimation engine, it's a language, a, a specific, a domain specific language for how to describe um, structural equation models, all right? So that, so we're really happy about that with, with, with seminar and we started kind of like using that, we started sharing it and then a lot of it happened by word of mouth people got, got to us and said, hey, we found this tool and, and it's really amazing for us, okay? Um, actually, some other amazing things have happened, by the way, on the side. We, uh, one thing is we met some, um, we actually met uh, some researchers at Google in their cloud services departments who do massive scale surveys, like 10,000, 20,000 people, not like 200, 300, okay? And uh, bizarrely enough, they're using PLS. Uh, to kind of uh, to derive some intelligence from from all these surveys they're generating, and uh, we we kind of uh, I got to meet them. We shared seminar with them. Uh, they use Python more than R, so they've actually started porting a lot of the functionality of seminar into a Python version of the tool. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, so so they're, they're creating a, like a Python version of and seminar, if you did will. They did they publish something? That would be really interesting to read, I guess. Well, they have an online package. Uh, it's called PLSPM, okay. but not the R package. They have, a, they have a package with the same name, PLSPM, but it's a Python package, all right? And it's open okay. source. You can Google it. If you search Google PLSPM, Python, GitHub, you'll find it on GitHub. They have an open source too. Very interesting, yes. Yeah, and we, we collaborate with them. We talk about a lot of joint problems, and we have some, uh, some um, uh, things in mind of what we're going to do together in the future as well uh, with them. So, so that's kind of exciting stuff. We got to meet a lot of exciting people um, uh, doing this kind of thing, right? Um, let me just say one more thing about like, you know, this world of coding versus the world of using these really easy to use um, tools like Smart PLS. Um, it's not an and or or proposition. It's not that do I use coding or do I use Smart PLS? It would be, that would be like asking, hey, uh, I'm a chef, should I use um, a big chef's knife or should I use a small peeling knife? Well, what are you trying to do? <laughs> if, you, if you walk into a kitchen, into a chef's kitchen, they have, they've got like 20 knives, right? They don't like, uh, they don't like argue about which one knife is the best. They use all the different types of knives they have. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we use Smart PLS in my lab and we use Seminar in my lab. We use all these tools, but for different purposes and for different ends, all right? Um, Stuff like Smart PLS is really awesome. It's super easy to use, and it brings a lot of people into this fold of latent modeling. So we cannot live without it. <laughs> we need it to get people into this world, right? Um, uh, it's, it's like you cannot argue about are planes better or cars better. I mean, uh, you can use cars in your country, but to get people into your country, you're going to need some planes, <laughs> right? So we need uh, no, Smart I think PLS. We have, I think we have Smart PLS uh, 4 also in pipeline at the moment. Yep, that's right. That's right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Ringlo and Marco and Christian can tell you more about that. There was some cool stuff coming out in there as well, right? So, so that's excellent. Use that tool. And, and you know what, what tools that Smart PLS are especially good at? And people, uh, I don't think even the Smart PLS marketing even kind of really mentions this. Where I would use Smart PLS and would only use Smart PLS and not Seminar is if I had to think a model through with other people live. Right? Like if I'm sitting with three other people and we're debating a model and trying to make it, draw it, estimate it, re-estimate it, I would use Smart PLS because it's visual. Everyone can see what you're doing. People can say, hey, move that over there. Oh, add an arrow here, right? Like they can visualize and see. It's a great collaborative yeah, tool. I, I had exactly the same idea. You know, one of the shortcomings in the paper, um, I think that applies to Elephant in the Room also, uh, but you're already doing a good job, which is, I really want to see the cross comparison or the, I mean, machine learning we have, um, 
scaffold mm -hmm. across validation. I want to use yeah. all these models and then see the output and then we can decide which model works best. So I mean, smart bill is a three option. Well, this is what you paid for, this is what you get. And by the way, that's uh, unbelievably expensive for Southeast Asia, the smart bill. Yeah, three. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so. so it, uh, this is something that um, I want to actually see in future research that, you know, that there is a cross comparison. So, so you use one model or one tool and then see the output and then you use the other one and then you yeah. cross validate that. I think that would uh, give, uh, take things in perspective. Absolutely right. So smart plus has its place, right? Um, wh why did, then why do we promote this tool called seminar when smart play PLS is so amazing? Actually coding has completely different benefits that visual tools cannot uh, meet easily. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, if I create a complex model and then I want to create, let's say two or three versions of this model <laughs> in a tool like smart PLS or in any visual tool, you literally have to copy your model, make it two or three mm -hmm. times, change something in one, change something in the other, pray to God that you there, the other things did not change. <laughs> and then, you know, over time it's very hard to reason and play with multiple alternatives to your model at the same time. Whereas when you've written things in code, you can reuse code much more easily. You can actually define a model and then create a separate model where you say, hey, you don't have to redefine it again. Just you can write in code, take that model and just change one thing. And you can literally write one line of code to do that. Mm -hmm. All right. So coding gives you this ability to actually reason in a, in a completely different way, which is yes, non-visual, but you can do much more dramatic changes and have multiple models you're running side by side and yet keeping them in sync much more easily with coding, all right? So this is one reason why we promote people to use seminar. You can actually do several things much more easily. The setup phase is much harder, but once you've got a model set up and then you make, need to make copies of it and change this and that, it actually becomes easier through code rather than visually. But there's another thing. To use something like seminar, you're gonna to have to learn a little bit of programming. In our case, the R programming language. Or you can use you know, the other packages in Python, for example. There's uh, one of the reasons we're really encouraging people to learn tools like Seminar is actually it's a gateway drug into programming. <laughs> it's getting people to learn some basic programming. Why do we want people to learn basic programming? Well, if you want to get past this world of just PLS and you want to kind of one day create like use machine learning models and self-driving cars and deep learning, that only happens through programming. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. So if you are a PLS practitioner today and I told you, you must learn programming. So one day you can do deep learning. It seems very intimidating, right? Because you've uh, got to learn deep learning and programming and it sounds crazy. But what if I told you, you can convert all the work you're doing today, let's say with surveys and, you know, PLS modeling, and you can do that through coding. Then you have a really good motivation to learn coding, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm, because exactly. then you can uh, yeah, you, and then you don't have to worry about the coding aspect. You can really enjoy the part that you know, which is setting up PLS models or SEM models just through code. And you have a, something familiar that you can deal with. So to us, mm -hmm. tools like Seminar are our secret, our secret, secret agenda is to get people to learn a little bit of coding so that then the whole world of data science and big data is suddenly opens up to them. Once mm -hmm. you can do that, creating a machine learning model is trivial. It will take you literally one more day to sit down yeah. and write your first, like, you know, use a neural net engine or a package or something like that. So this is our I think secret. I should thing. actually, yeah. I, I should really steal your strategy of luring students into the R word. Um, that's what I actually normally do with my workshops in R that, you know, I tell students that, oh, that's well, right. there's a graphic yeah. user interface for R also. You can use R commanders. And, you know, once you sure. lure them in, sure. you can still do that like smart PLS3 and then, yeah. then they get into R. And then once they actually have this taste of blood, you know, then they get addicted yep. to that. And, you know, then they simply and then, have to yeah. look over data sets and then it's like lightning speed that um, their results yeah. are uh, coming out and, you know, they can make inference. And actually it gives me a lot of pleasure that, you know, they are coming yeah. with very solid research. Um, and most of the journals, at least in psychology, um, these days they're um, asking you to submit the R code uh, for yeah. their research and the original data. Um, and you know, if they have that on hand, um, that's even better. Otherwise, editors have to actually go and take their um, smart PLS right. three or uh, spaces file and reproduce that. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. Sure, go ahead. Uh, oh, I just one more thing to say, which was you mentioned this really important thing about the cost of commercial tools. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, I think smart PLS is very fairly priced because I'm a software developer and I know what it would take me to create smart PLS 
and I think they have a lot, their, their, their price is very reasonable given the human effort it takes to make that. So I, I totally support their pricing. However, if you're in a Southeast Asian or South Asian context and that money is difficult to, to kind of like bring up, then all the more reason to learn some coding, right? Because exactly. there, is, there is no tooth, no analysis that you can't do with free coding tools. There's nothing. Deep, mm -hmm. Nobody pays to do deep learning except for maybe infrastructure costs. But uh, everything from machine learning to everything is all free if you know how to do coding. So mm -hmm. money can be just thrown out of the picture as soon as you know some coding, right? And I think exactly. this, is important. Uh, this is important for us. And then the last thing I will mention is, once people learn some coding, you can make this other transformation in your life, which will bring you much more happiness, which is you can go from being a tool user to being a tool producer, right? Exactly. And I think, That's and I think this is a philosophical mindset that we as particularly South Asians have to make in that we are very giddy when we know how to use a tool but actually you're just a consumer <laughs> and that's, mm. um, that's not something to be that proud about. We should can mm. change our mindset to becoming producers and people who make things, not just people who like tell everyone, Hey, you know what an ex expert I am. I know how to press these buttons, right? Um, we need to make that mindset and it's, and I, I'm in a management school and you, you, you've, you've taught and done many things around the world of management, I think as well. Um, and I think this is a mindset that we need to change in, in South Asia. Uh, I'm from India, so particularly I'm concerned about India, which is that we have this whole generation of students who all want to be managers, right? And none of them want to actually make anything. <laughs> so, and that's untenable. It's untenable. Mm -hmm. How are you going to have a nation where everyone's a talking head and nobody can listen and make anything? <laughs> so um, I think we've gone too far in this, in this direction. And we need to move back to, to becoming a culture that values tool making, and producing and actually working with our hands, you know, and, and things like that. So, um, so this is again, the reason I promote programming in Asia in particular is to tell people that um, you don't have to just see yourself as a clever consumer of things and then a manager of people. Um, uh, you alienate yourself from the world when you do that. You, we should actually go back to being tool creators and people who make things <laughs> and then by all means manage the things you have made Right, and I, and, I, and I say this because when I ask even people in Asia, hey, which uh, managers do you admire the most, <laughs> right? Who did they mention? Elon Musk, Steve Jobs. Well, these people weren't selling random things. They were selling stuff they made, <laughs> right? Mm, so um, we need to become people who make things and then get engaged and excited about selling or managing the things we make ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm very glad that you actually brought this topic and that's been um, a consistent theme in my teaching and in my conversation with my students and uh, my clients and, and colleagues in general, that um, unfortunately in our part of the world, uh, we probably do not have uh, all altruistic reasons to do the research uh, for something. Some people go after prestige. Um, some people look up to these figures like Elon Musk and um, Steve Ballmer and uh, other um, successful people because they think it's good to be rich. But what they don't understand mm -hmm. is that, you know, um, you can aspire to be um, Somia Ray, but you also have to follow his life path. So it's just not like a shortcut to <laughs> being mm -hmm. a professor and get published. Um, produce something of value um, that actually helps mankind, um, humanity, you know, that generates solid research you know, and that's reputable. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, these things come um, automatically afterwards. So do not focus on what you can get out of that. You know, that has to be right. like an a labor of love, you know. So you've Absolutely. created this bag. I don't think that, you know, you're selling it out for a million or something, but it's something that you wanted to do and something that you think would be helpful and that's helping a lot right. of people. And this is what I think should be the core of what we're doing. Now, uh, thank you so much for being here, Somia. Uh, we have a rapid fire round here um, because we have- Whoa, okay. Uh, we have a notorious um, reputation, we academics, that we are very boring people. So I just wanted to explore some <laughs> other aspects of your life also. Uh, what are some of the peers that you actually like? Um, and if you can go um, a mile beyond the one that you don't like. <laughs> can, you, can you say that word again? What are the... What are the... Your peers, colleagues um, in the field um, that you're working oh. in? 
peers that, that you're I admire. inspired by. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Well, I already mentioned one, my colleague, Gali Chwelli, who comes from a very predictive world, and I'm very inspired by her for one particular reason. She comes from statistics, but she yeah. was learning, she was mastering predictive analytics and things like that at a time when that was not sexy, at a time when people <laughs> would have said, why are you not doing really hardcore statistics? Why are you doing this fringe stuff? It turns out the French stuff was the most important stuff. Who knew, <laughs> right? So I admire people like her, definitely. Um, I, and I, I think you know Marco. I admire Marco yeah. tremendously, right? Um, uh, and, uh, and by extension, also people like Christian Ringler and others uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that, uh, well, let's start with Christian first because he actually makes a tool, Smart PLS. I, love, I mean, I love the fact that he makes a tool. Mm. He's not just worried about, my God, where are my research papers going to go? Not, his, not that he has this tool, people reach out to him to write research papers with them, right? So exactly. I, I value the tool makers of the world. I value the makers of the world, right? Um, and I value people like, like Marco um, because they bring a lot of clarity to what, they, what we're doing. And they don't just stick around and start proposing like weird permutations and combinations of hackneyed ideas. People like Marco, for example, they really push the ideas forward beyond maybe even their zone of comfort. But it gets us all to push our field forward, right? So, um, so I really admire these people who kind of leap out and do things that may seem fringe at first, but then turns out to be the real value of being in the research field, right? Okay. Um, all right, so I mean, yeah, if you get to choose one vacation spot that you absolutely have to go, um, what would that be that you want to go um, again um, to that point? I mean, I assume that you travel. Uh, when you're not doing ground yeah, yeah, research. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, am, I am extraordinarily well-traveled. I've probably been to like 20, 30 countries easily. Um, it'll be very hard to pick one. But let me tell you my favorite places that I have been to. Um, I have, uh, uh, I was very surprised. South Africa was a place that I went as a kid and I was blown away by it. Um, it's an amazing place. There's, you know, tensions and social problems and this and that. Um, but Africa as a whole, and I'll, okay, may, let me expand that. By the way, I lived in Kenya for many years. Africa yeah, as a whole is, is an amazing place. And um, people's image of it is, is a disservice to Africa itself and it's a disservice to all of us. It's, you know, Africa as a whole is incredibly beautiful. Um, the people there are amazing because they hold very few of the prejudices that many of us hold in other parts of the world. <laughs> okay, I mean, they have their own problems again, but, it's, but in terms of the people and the place and how beautiful it is, um, I hope we don't ruin it in trying to so quote unquote develop it. <laughs> All right. Mm. So I would, yeah, I would I was, say last yeah. Yeah, I had the same reservations that other people uh, would have um, until uh, when I get to got to travel last year uh, in Rwanda and Uganda. And now I understand, you know, it's out of the world. You know, it, it's a whole new world. A lot of inspirations to be taken. Uh, people are very friendly. Yeah. Um, it's really easy to get to, um, especially when you're coming from a subcontent background. It's not really hard to get to know them. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. Now, another uh, researcher's questions. Uh, we have bad reputations of. Um, being a good cooks, uh, what can you cook? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, cooking used to be my, my like really major passion. In fact, I would have finished my PhD a lot faster if I didn't like cooking. <laughs> if I had to suffer through cafeteria food in the US, I would, be, well, I would have been done in a rush. <laughs> um, honestly, I love to cook just really simple home style Bengali food, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. and um, uh, I, I, I love South Asian cooking as a whole. I mean, I know how to do a little bit of Italian cooking, some American cooking, some African dishes. And, you know, I know some of this stuff. But at the end of the day, um, I love South Asian cooking, you know, Indian cooking and Pakistani cooking, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Um, uh, I think it's, uh, it's phenomenal. Um, what in particularly, what do I like to cook? It would be like bizarrely simple things even. Like I, I know how to cook really complicated dishes. But, and it wows all my friends, particularly my Western friends are like, oh my God, this thing is so amazing if I cook a very complicated curry. But honestly, I love most cooking simple things like fish with mustard, <laughs> you know, like which is a very Bengali thing to make. And, um, or even a simple dal, you know, like I think there's a lot of enjoyment to be had out of like the most simple dishes that are staple dishes like in, in, in South Asia. So honestly, those are things I enjoy the most. 
But if I had to impress a, a crowd, I will make like very, very fancy, very rich curries and things like that. And everyone will be amazed. And I will think to myself, yeah, well, if I throw 50 things into a pot, of course, it's going to be amazing. That's it's really not as impressive as they think. <laughs> but if you can make a good That's... South Asian, yeah, if you can make a good Pakistani or Indian or Bangladeshi dish, with just five ingredients, then you've got something to brag about. <laughs> okay. Oh, we might take you up on that offer next time you're going to visit Pakistan. Certainly. <laughs> for now, um, you have been in Taiwan for a while. Um, have you tried uh, Taiwanese or Chinese food? Uh, is there a particular favorite? Yeah, um, there's a lot of really good food in uh, East Asia, in China, Taiwan in particular. Um, uh, unfortunately, and this is going to come as very depressing news for Pakistanis in particular, is that a lot of it involves pork, unfortunately. <laughs> All right, um, but they have, but they have uh, signature dishes with uh, with beef as well, and with fish and with chicken. Um, the thing I will say though is, if uh, it will be of no value for me to tell you the name of the dishes because they're totally different from the dishes that we usually associate with Chinese cooking in either South okay. Asia or in America or other places. The, the food like that I the Chinese food I ate in America was turned out to be actually very niche Hong Kong street food. It had, it had nothing to do with China as a whole. So when I visited you know China and Taiwan, I was like, these dishes are amazing. How come I've never experienced them before in my life? Um, uh, so they're, they're a total uh, hidden hidden treasure, right? <laughs> yeah. So it was a pleasure having you on the show. Um, I totally enjoyed our conversation. Um, I think that there was a lot of issues um, that um, a lot of people uh, were um, perplexed about that you have cleared uh, today. And of course, um, you know, that would set future for a lot of other people. And of course, you're uh, focused on developing our own tools. Um, any last message for students um, and researchers um, that you'd like to give through your experience, through your learning and future directions of PLS? Um, you know, you have the... Yeah, um, well, I, I won't talk about PLS anymore. I think we've, we've beat that horse till it's black and blue, right? Um, but let me just kind of give one little comment to like students, right? Because students are always afraid about like, how am I going to become an amazing researcher? And I'll tell you something that I learned the hard way, which is that if you do research, which is exactly like the amazing research that you're seeing in journals today, you're going to turn into a mediocre researcher <laughs> because today's research, today's amazing research will be tomorrow's mediocre research. All right. So if, if all you're doing is saying, wow, these models I'm seeing in A papers today, I want to do that stuff. Well, in 10 years time, that'll be old stuff. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, and same with the domains. If you say, oh my God, e-commerce is great. Well, that you know, it was a long time ago. Well, by the time you are become a professor or a researcher or an industry person, that's going to be old stuff. Um, the thing I tell to students is, apart from, you know, engage in your research, get, get as good as you can with your methodology while you're a PhD student or a researcher because you won't have time to get better at it after, right? Um, but the other thing I tell people is think about the other passions you have in life and think to yourself in the long arc of things how you could bring these things together, all right. It happened to me to be for me since I was a kid. I loved coding. And uh, then I started getting into the world of social science. And now I'm trying to bring those things together to make coding tools for social science. And I'm just beginning at it. And we've got a whole bunch of you know, products and things in the in the in the pipeline that I'm not going to talk about today, uh, which are even way more amazing than the seminar potentially. Right. Um, but that happens to be my particular like, you know, bringing back something that was you know, in my left pocket that I was good at a long time ago and bringing it back into what I'm doing today. Think what that is in your life. Maybe you love music, right? Um, keep thinking over the long arc of terms, like how your research and your love of music or sport or whatever it is, um, how you can kind of slowly kind of merge these things and find some overlap between the two. Because when these things do overlap, two things happen. First of all, it becomes much more amazing because no one's ever seen that combination before. And the second thing that happens is someone somewhere is desperately looking for people with these combined skills and can't find them. Mm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and when you master two things and you bring them together, you become the only person in the world who can do those two things <laughs> together. And everyone gets blown away and goes, uh, wow, how come you know how to write code to create tools for, uh, I don't know, social science. And I say, well, those are two completely separate things till I brought them together, right? <laughs> um, 
And, and, and so, so this is what I encourage people is like develop this other side of yourself, master it, get good at it, see how you can bring them, uh, bring them together over the long arc, you know, arc of your career and your life. And uh, you will be much richer for it than just kind of going in one direction and basically following some other storied researchers. Thank you so much, Samir, for being on the show. Um, it's a pleasure having you, and hopefully we're going to get you um, in the future also uh, in a lot of interesting things, because I still think that there are lots of things that, have, uh, that we have left unexplored. Um, but thank you so much for today. Thank you, Minaj, and I hope this is the beginning of a great uh, conversation between us, all right? Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.